I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector Podcast, and I have joining me the chairman of the board of Osisco Metals, Robert Wares. Welcome, Robert. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's uh, It's been a quiet time for the company, but uh, there's been an awful lot of things going on behind the scenes, so it'll be good to get an update for uh, everybody as to what's been, uh, what's been happening. But before we do that, as always... Not everyone's familiar with you, so let's give them the uh, the big picture view from above. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, for so for those of you who are not familiar with the Gas Bay Copper Project, it's it's one of the largest copper development uh, projects in Canada at this point. Uh, we're sitting on a resource of about eight hundred twenty million tons uh, indicated, and uh, six hundred forty um, inferred. Of about uh, 0.35 copper equivalent, uh, so basically 0.28 copper plus some aluminum and uh, silver credits. Uh, so it's quite large. Uh, at uh, 1.5 billion uh, total resources, uh, we've initiated a 110,000 meter drill program this year to convert uh, the entire resource uh, intermeasured indicated uh, by uh, February 26. And uh, obviously, we're also hoping to expand with the current drill program, expand uh, on the resource significantly. And so uh, quite exciting. Uh, we're still very bullish on copper. Copper is doing very well, slowly inching towards 450 uh, US a pound on the spot, spot price. And uh, I think timing is absolutely perfect to be uh, building a copper asset uh, in, in Canada, which is still uh, a number one uh, jurisdiction for mining. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's been a surprise. The copper price is uh, uh, held up uh, really well this year in spite of uh, some significant headwinds. And uh, I think that we're starting to see some of the initial effects of the, uh, the copper shortages that people have been projecting into the future uh, starting to show up in the prices. Um, you just uh, completed a round of assays of, of that drill program that started. Uh, let's uh, let's get on our horse and brag a little bit about some of those results. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, firstly, we raised a uh, hundred million dollars, just over a hundred million dollars last uh, November. Closed it in early December. Uh, we took advantage of a, a window of opportunity. A lot of the new buyers are actually gold funds. And uh, they were liquid as a result of the sale of a Cisco mining of the windfall project. <clears throat> so it was a perfect opportunity uh, for us to not only get uh, the team back together on one project, but uh, to raise a significant amount of uh, funding. So as a result, uh, we now have uh, much broader uh, analyst uh, coverage, far more than we had before. And uh, right now we've got uh, coverage by Canaccord uh, Hannum Partners out of London, uh, National Bank, Scotia Bank, uh, BMO is supposed to come in and Velocity Trade with an average consensus target price of about a buck ten. So a real game changer for us, and uh, we are fully financed right now to carry the project through to uh, FID. Uh, we're still targeting 2029 for uh, for construction decision. So the till is full, and uh, the drill program this year is going to cost uh, about $35 million, which we're currently executing with uh, eight drills on site. Yeah, that's one of the things I've always liked about a Cisco Group uh, companies. When they drill, they're drilling. It's multiple drills, multiple holes. I know it, can, it uh, angers some of the competition when it gets to... Uh, to get to the assay labs because you guys uh, yeah. overwhelm the labs when you do bring material in, but uh, that's uh, that's one of the benefits of being a big dog on the uh, on the street is you get to do that. Yeah. So you just had a number of uh, initial drill results on this program. Uh, how much of the of the drilling uh, has been assayed now? Well, we've announced about, uh, I think it was 16 holes. Um, I haven't had them up, actually. We had three press releases starting in mid-May, uh, working on another one as we speak. So the, the bottom line is that all of our holes uh, pretty much came in expectation. 
But with the added uh, good news is that we hit mineralization in all holes at deeper levels. Uh, we can't say right now whether or not it's going to fit into uh, the future the future Whittle pit model. But uh, we're looking at uh, very significant intersections in, in some of the deeper portions of our current drill hole. Uh, up to 150 meters, uh, for example, running 0.6, so we're also getting better grade um, than the average uh, current grade of the deposit. In fact, if I take the weighted average grade of all our drill results right now, we're sitting about 0.32% copper uh, compared to the current resource, which is averaging about 0.28. So, so far, our drilling is, is uh, proving up additional uh, material, uh, higher grade material that hopefully will uh, squeeze into uh, into the pit. But notable intersections also included uh, 320 meters at 0.4. Um, we had another one at 300 meters, uh, 0.43. And uh, some higher grade zones in the last press release, uh, we plowed through the Scarn horizons uh, and our best intersection in the Scarn was running 30 meters at 1.9% uh, copper and about uh, 15 grams silver. So there are higher grade zones uh, in the deposit as well that are still uh, waiting, uh, waiting down there to be mined. So uh, we're very happy so far with the results and uh, with eight drills on site, we're going to keep pounding out uh, results till, uh, till year end actually. Yeah, it's going to be a steady stream of news flow on that. Now, the drill holes that have been done, the 16, were they infills, were they step outs, were they both? Uh, three of them were step outs and the rest were infill. So uh, it's become pretty clear that the, um, uh, the deposit extends to the south at this point and uh, could potentially extend another 600 meters south with any luck to the nose of the uh, Needle Mountain uh, anticlinal structure, where there's a lot of underground workings at the time. So uh, the, the story is very simple. I mean, basically, the underground workings focused on high-grade scarns and the intervening altered hornfells uh, with low-grade disseminated were essentially ignored during the entire life of mine of gas pay copper. And of course, since we're looking at a large, uh, potentially large bulk tonnage opens scenario, uh, anything above 0.12 is of interest, uh, percent copper is of interest to us. So it's a question of evaluating the, uh, the intervening stratigraphy and how, establishing how much low grade mineralization is still sitting there. So uh, with the current program, we're, we're gonna be going deeper than the current uh, resource base in all our holes hoping to add uh, tonnage at depth, but also hoping to expand uh, to the south uh, as far as uh, the drills will take us uh, this year. Uh, we certainly won't have time to evaluate uh, the entire potential expansion of the resource this year, so um, that will carry on to 26. But the, uh, the drop dead date for assays will be December 15th because we do have to get that resource out by February, the new updated uh, MRE. And uh, that'll lead directly to the PEA study. So while we're doing the PEA next year, uh, we're going to carry on doing exploratory drilling to see whether there's uh, potential for resource expansion. So that's the drills and the drills are going to be turning all uh, for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, but that's not all that's going on there on site. There's there's a whole bunch of other work that's uh, being done right now in preparation for that PEA, which is probably a little bit more than just the PEA, if truth uh, be told. Yeah, we're actually, uh, the only reason it's not going to be a pre-fees is we don't have enough geotechnical data, pit geotechnical data. We're going to be uh, sufficient and fully armed on the metallurgical and mineral processing side, trade-off studies, uh, evaluation of uh, power needs and so on, and uh, infrastructure evaluation, including the deep water port and gas bay. So yeah, we're just, we're just going to be short of a pre fees but um, ultimately it does matter because after the PEA, we're moving directly uh, to feasibility, which we hope to get out in uh, early 28. Yeah, and um, this other work that's been going on, where where does it fit into the big picture? Uh, we're 
doing a lot of testing right now, uh, still evaluation for the pit dewatering, which actually has to start uh, the latest uh, next spring. So uh, we're gonna we're shooting for at least a, a permit to do uh, pumping tests uh, this year. And uh, we're looking at options right now for water treatment. So uh, if we can complete the, pro the enough testing this year, uh, we're all set to start pumping, uh, emptying the pit next year, which will take uh, two to two and a half years uh, at the rate that's going to be environmentally benign. There's about 35 million cubic meters of water to, to dispose of. The other aspects that uh, we're also launching uh, the phase one environmental impact study, uh, which also, of course is uh, describing all the flora and the fauna uh, on site. Uh, we've got another 80 sample uh, mineral processing slash metallurgical uh, testing program that was just launched last week. Uh, samples uh, are all going to be in the lab by the end of uh, August, and uh, <clears throat> we should have uh, start getting results on that testing. Uh, oh, I would say probably by the time we get the MRE out in the next February, but I do not anticipate any surprises because we, we ran 30 samples last year and the results are very favorable. So uh, this is just a question of quantifying uh, the results on the rest uh, of the uh, deposit. We're also going to do launch a condemnation drilling program uh, around the site this fall uh, to condemn essentially poten potential tailings impoundment areas, uh, which has to be submitted as part of the PEA. And so um, those areas will be tested to ensure uh, there are no hidden ore deposits again beneath what could potentially be a tailings pond. So quite a quite a busy work. We've got about fifty people on site uh, executing uh, various aspects of uh, this year's program. Yeah, it's uh, it is a busy time for the company now. This this is a former mining site. There there was mining done here in the past. Yeah. Um, does that make this part of the work easier or more difficult? Actually, it has no impact. Uh, you still have to go through the same process and any. You know, and the environmental record of the site, of course, helps in terms of being able to document the past and mitigate risk. For example, there's never been any acid runoff off this property because uh, the deposit was formed in a, a limestone and calcareous sedimentary sequence. So the rocks just naturally uh, neutralize any acid influent, effluent that's uh, created by mining operations. So that kind of thing is useful in terms of uh, mitigating uh, mitigating environmental impacts, uh, but we still have to go through the process. It's, it's the same as if it was a Greenville site for all intents and purposes. It just uh, vastly increases your chances of, uh, of getting uh, your permit uh, compared to a Greenfield site. And of course, because the area is already impacted, uh, there's less of an impact, uh, especially on the flora. So overall, uh, you don't save on time, but you certainly save, uh, it makes it easier to get your permits, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess uh, the previous permit holders would have found all the surprises and uh, there shouldn't be too much mystery there anymore. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, there's also an environmental impact done in, done in about 2006 for the local wind farms. They had to go through the whole process as well, so. A lot, uh, lot of documentation of uh, the natural environment in this area. Yeah, it's uh, actually probably an ideal place for you to be working in because uh, there, there is a lot of uh, industrialization has already occurred, so it should uh, make the path to production a lot oh, easier. Yeah. Well, especially on the infrastructure side, uh, you still have a paved road going down to deep water port for uh, concentrate export. Uh, the power line, the substation is still on site. Uh, Murdochville, obviously, uh, which is the original town for the, the mine, mining town, has been in economic decline since the closure of the mine in 1999. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure is still there, a lot of homes available, so uh, attracting a new workforce uh, should not be a problem. Outstanding. Exciting times for the company, and if people want to uh, follow this story and, uh, and keep abreast of things, how would they do so, Robert? Uh, best way is to uh, go on the website, uh, look at our social media, and sign up for uh, press releases if uh, they're, they're so uh, 
and they're so inclined, you just have to uh, send a note on uh, info at ciscometals.com. Wonderful. Uh, I look forward to uh, updates later in the year as uh, this uh, drilling program uh, continues on. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, everything ends up next February with uh, a new uh, resource going yeah. into the PEA. Yeah, well, we're very excited about that and certainly looking forward to, uh, I hope, something that will be absolutely spectacular. Perfect. Thanks again for your time, Robert. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Cisco Metals is a paid sponsor of the Prospector News. The Prospector News podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.